Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as provost, it's my pleasure to welcome all undergraduate and graduate students to this virtual town hall. I hope your holidays were a time to relax with family and refresh uh, for the new quarter ahead of us. This month, we're embarking on a new phase in Drexel's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is going to be a time when we hope that many of you will be able to return to campus. Some of you will attend in-person classes and others will be able to work in labs and studio settings. Today, we're going to talk about some of the steps being taken to safeguard the Drexel community from the coronavirus. You'll hear about our weekly COVID-19 testing program. And we're going to stress that each of you plays a role in the collective health of our campus community. So I want uh, to keep, I want you to keep wearing your face masks to maintain safe distance and wash your hands frequently. You should also perform a daily symptom check-in through the Drexel Health Checker app. Drexel has prepared extensively to support the health of the community, including comprehensive testing, contact tracing programs, and added safety protocols. That's why it's so essential that we all embrace personal and collective responsibility and follow public health guidance to have a successful winter term and protect our community. In my time at Drexel, I've observed that our students, our faculty and professional staff are truly committed to the mission and values of the university and to our unique approach to education. There's a passion and energy here that you don't find at every university. I believe we can tap into that passion to keep our campus as safe as possible as we return in greater numbers. Today, we have a great group of speakers uh, to, to talk with you today. Uh, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from Sabir Sahu, our Senior Vice President of Student Success. After that, Dr. Marla Gold, who's you'll we'll hear from uh, Dr. Marla Gold, who heads our Return Oversight Committee, and Dr. Janet Caruz, Director of Student Health Services. Then we'll, we will follow that with a panel discussion. And on our panel today, we'll have Mackenzie Luke and Katie Zemelinski from Student Life, Don Liberati from Campus Services, Annette Molino from Counseling, and Elizabeth Van Boxdale from the Graduate College. And helping us moderate today will be Anna Koulis from the Drexel Solutions Institute. So thank you again for joining us. I'm looking forward to a, a great conversation. And uh, now we'll go to uh, Sabir Sahu. Sabir. Thank you, Provost Jensen. Hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, Provost Jensen said, my name is Sabir Sahu, and I have the privilege of serving as the Senior Vice President for Student Success here at Drexel. Um, we are so thrilled and excited to reopen our campus and welcome all of you back to campus for those of you who are coming to either stay in our residence halls or coming back for face-to-face -face classes. We're thrilled that our move-in weekend starts on Saturday and continues into next week. And it's important for all of you to know that we've had graduate law and medical students with us from the fall. We're very excited to open our doors and welcome more undergraduate students to campus. The goal for today is simple. We want to give you the tools so that you can come to campus experience what you missed in the fall, but do so with health and safety at the forefront. This is what we do. We love having all of you here. This is going to be a collective effort to ensure that we're working together and that we can keep our campus active and open and take care of one another. To that, we have significant and fantastic leaders who are giving us guidance through every step of the way. It's really my privilege to introduce two of the main voices helping us from a health and safety perspective. Uh, coming up next will be Dr. Marla Gold, who's our Director for Return to Campus Operations and our Vice Provost for Community Health Care and Innovation, and Dr. Janet Cruz, who's our Director of Student Health. Dr. Gold. Thanks, Sabir. It's great to be here, everybody. I know that some of you have been to our town halls, uh, one or two of our student town halls in the past. I know we have undergraduate students, graduate students here, students on quarters, students on semesters. We refer to that now as the winter term, but there's a spring semester in there. And I certainly know that we have some parents joining us as well, and I welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to Give an overview and then I'll be turning it over uh, as you heard to Dr. Cruz. Let me have the next slide. 
So let me start here. This is a little bit different in the past. Wherever you are, whether it's in the region, somewhere else in the nation, you'll be joining us soon. You're down the street already in off-campus housing. Wherever you are, you are used to getting messaged on things like wear a mask, keep your distance, wash hands, and now more recently, testing has a very big role, uh, both in treatment, prevention, and containment of COVID-19. But let's face it, this is not an easy task, all of it, for anyone. Right? It's not easy for anyone, and it really is not easy for young people of college age for lots of reasons. But we are functioning at a university during a pandemic, and we believe from our track record thus far, information from other institutions of higher education, the published literature, our abilities, and more that you'll hear about during this town hall, that we're ready for you. But it's not an easy task. There's a fair amount of social isolation. Some of you are having that where you are and experiencing it. And even on campus, depending on whether you form a pod with people that you know are in your circle uh, and you can trust and have an understanding with, there can be isolation that you need to manage and we'll help you with that. Of course, we're requiring masking here in Philadelphia. It's a requirement, indoor, outdoor. You have to keep your distance and be aware of hand washing. Pod formation, I put a couple of stars up there. We'll have more resources for you, for students, to talk about what that is. While many of you think you know, and probably you do know, there are still some that don't fully understand what it means to stick with your pod or stick with the household, however you define it. There are no real gatherings indoors without mass and distance, right, outside of the pod, and that's important. And there's required testing and open testing, and we'll talk about it. There are the challenges of relationships, maintaining old ones and forming new ones. And you're in a major city that's following COVID related protocols. Now you and your parents, if they're here, may be saying, well, isn't this a great way to start a town hall? Next slide. But keep going, next slide. If we can do these things, if we can collectively accomplish it, and we have been so far, you will stay healthy. You'll still be able to see one another we'll still be able to be with you. You'll still have more independence in one of the best cities around. We love our city, Philadelphia, and the region. There's so much to offer even during the pandemic. You will experience, depending on your curricula, some face-to-face -face classes, labs, studios. You'll be on a university campus. It will increasingly feel like college. And you'll experience, as I mentioned, a major urban center. And there are a lot more benefits as well. We want you here, we wanna keep moving, and we believe what we've created here, um, as well as being a college city and what many universities that are opening further and further as we get used to the protocols are creating, will give you some sense of safety. But of course, as Subir mentioned, and as Provost Jensen mentioned, we need you. Next. So just to remind everybody, our winter term plans have been fully approved by the Department of Public Health. Again, when I say term, I don't want to leave anybody out. I'm talking quarter, semester, whatever you're on. So if you think in spring semester, I'm referring that right now as winter term because you're still coming in January. So the winter term plans are fully approved by the health department. We have a very strict health department here in Philly. And as someone who's been personally on the Board of Health for several decades, I'm pretty proud of that actually during a pandemic. The county currently has some of the, the best, uh, they're not, you know, the, the rates of disease and them being lower, they're coming down lower. So uh, I'm very happy about that. We have athletic plans actually that have been approved by the health department, including tier one basketball. And while you can't physically be in the game, you can see it or listen to it. I often will watch it uh, on a social device and root for my teams. The men and women's teams are doing pretty well this year. We have athletic plans. Those teams are tested, for example, daily, uh, but they've been doing very well. Our facilities are ready for you. Our systems are all reviewed and addressed uh, where necessary to get ready for you, all important. The College of Medicine, the College of Nursing and Health Professions, the Klein School of Law, graduate and research programs, they've already successfully run without interruption and they're running right now. And over the fall, test positivity was at or below 2% except just like you're hearing nationally after Halloween and after Thanksgiving, where we had bumps. Halloween was about three and a half percent. You'll see that in a minute. 
and Thanksgiving as high as 4%, reflecting not on what happened in the classroom or the library or the gym, none of those places, not what happened on the campus green, but what happened at the dinner table, what happened at a small gathering or a party. These are difficult times and we understand that. Uh, in the last couple of days, the state has been running at about 12% for tests. It's a little bit lower now. The city 9% a couple days ago, but it's heading towards 7% now. We'd like to see these percents under five. And as I've said to you, we've run 2% or lower most of the time. Next slide, please. This is our dashboard. Some of you have seen this. If you go onto our Drexel website, our response to coronavirus and, and that these uh, links have been made very public to you in mailings, you can find this information out. If you look at the top line, it's total tests in the previous week. So this is last week. Uh, these are just open tests for people who are here because we're not fully open yet. So open tests means they're not assigned and mandatory yet, but that's coming as you know from the mail for those of you who'll be getting mandatory testing, you've been hearing from us. And you can see that all in percent positivity, that top line was 2.4%. You can see that screening tests, so people who had no symptoms that came for a screening test, that that was 1.8%. We'd love to see it zero, but that's not realistic. Still 1.8% is a very low number. And all, when you look symptomatic, you're always gonna see, so students, parents, uh, friends, you're going to see a higher number there. And you'd expect to see that because people who are coming with symptoms, a, a significant percent of them are going to come with COVID. I should say here, we don't want to talk about young people as if this is not a serious disease for them. So parents and students, please know we care first and foremost about you. So when we say, oh, positive, negative, we have seen in our students either mild, either asymptomatic mild disease or moderate, where somebody has something like a very awful head cold, congestion, low grade fever, some muscle aches, and perhaps Dr. Cruz will speak more to that when we get to that. And then you can see cumulatively uh, since October, actually, when we began reporting, we've certainly been testing longer than that our numbers. And on the right, it shows you this by week. Next slide, please. And when we look on the graph, you can see those bumps. I can't use the mouse the way I like to normally use uh, as a physician, but if you see that 3.5% up near the 4% line, and then you see 4%, I can put a pumpkin on that 3.5% and a turkey on that 4% because there are holidays happening. And one of the reasons why we were asked um, to uh, delay by the health department, and we were really forcefully asked to delay uh, on quarters we opened earlier in the beginning, our plans more than others is that nobody wanted to see a holiday tree or a New Year's celebration happening on our numbers. Uh, those absolutely could drive numbers up from small get togethers all around the nation. And then those could be with more people arriving who had active disease who then would spread even further in small gatherings so that we could have a, almost a twin uh, of bouncing off events and we wanted to avoid it. Next slide. Next please. Thank you. So you'll see, no, no, I'm sorry, go back up one, my bad. So what do we have? We have a mandatory health and safety online training. Students, when you go on that, we have a the voiceover on that. You know, when I, when I first listened to it and we put it together, realistically, we're very realistic about this. This is not made to lull you. Please don't be doing this thing. What do I gotta do? Let me flip through this. Okay, I got it. I know it. Let me sign the pledge. You're gonna accept the dragon pledge. There's a lot of verbiage in there. And I strongly suggest that you read it and know it because it also includes what you agree to sign up for, the compliance language that we're asking you to do. Uh, there's nothing hidden in there. All the information that we want you to know. The mandatory training, even though it's all posted what to do on the website, we'll be messaging you, there are signage around campus, but we want you to see it at least one time so that you understand what is COVID, how do you get it, how can you give it to others, how can you stay as safe as possible. Very important. I have found that all of us think we know until it happens to us, and then there's a flurry of panic while we try and look up what we're supposed to do and wonder how it happens. So please work with us on this. We really appreciate it. And you'll see these signs. Uh, it's up on the website. You'll see cards if you haven't received masks from us yet about face masks are required, um, and yours will go down over the chin and cover better than that one. But we have banners up around campus. Washing hands, you know this. 
checking in with the app will say more about it. If you're sick, you feel sick or you have a fever, you are to stay put and call student health and of course, maintaining your distance. And you see I added here, and COVID testing. While the Centers for Disease Control has hinted at COVID testing as a part of uh, actually prevention, institutions of higher education that have advanced science such as Drexel and Penn and Temple in our town and Jefferson have been doing this for quite some time. Next slide, please. And so you, you hear us saying over and over, download the app to date, you know, well over 10,000, 12,000, probably 15, we'll hear from Dr. Cruz have downloaded the app. We always have more students to do it. Look, you need the app in order to check in and get that green check. You also need the app in order to schedule your tests and to get your results. And filling it out correctly, and we give you more instructions using your Drexel uh, ID, which is something like, like mine, MJG32, some your letters and numbers and not a .com and not a Gmail address, but your Drexel email where you're asked for, that's how we're gonna work with you in order for you to access your own results and do things quickly and, and actually enjoy campus life and be on your way. Next slide. So there was a very long, somewhat complex, I regret that, but we have lots of different groups of students living in different areas, starting at different times in different programs. The decision for how often to test and what test to use is based on risk, and that risk was calculated using a lot of science in the background by what we know. You will see that some regional campuses test certain students twice a week. Depending on what test they use and how they're doing it, they may have found that to be a better strategy. Here at Drexel, we have found that certain students will participate in the beginning in required weekly testing as follows. Those students who live in university housing, students who live in buildings connected to university housing. So that's all of American campus communities uh, and API, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Students in Greek housing, any students taking face-to-face -face classes, uh, if all of those things don't shake out and you're in a research lab anyway, uh, we also want you to have required weekly testing. And then there are select student athletes who follow NCAA guidelines. They're going for daily testing with different kinds of methods, uh, and we watch them very carefully. Before I move from this slide, and we'll hear more from Dr. Cruz, I want to be very clear that those who are moving in, that move in week, which begins on Saturday, You'll be getting your testing as you move in. There's a whole protocol we'll be following. So you won't be able to schedule your mandatory test till the end of next week. I'm gonna ask that you and your families bear with us as we get everybody safely tucked in and get everyone used to the system here. So for a while, it won't surprise us that there'll be a lot of questions, but please know we're here to answer them. And we are in the background making sure that we get it right and we get everybody settled. Next slide. All other students, so a lot of people have said, I'm not in any of those groups, can I still get a test? And the answer is yes. You can opt for open testing Monday through Friday. It is, of course, by availability, and that was spelled out in the memo that went out, but you can do that. We want you to be able to do that. We particularly are interested in students who have several roommates um, because those roommates may inadvertently, we hope it's inadvertent, uh, attend gatherings or have something happen where in fact, there's an exposure or perceived exposure and you wanna get yourself tested, right? Now, if you're exposed or you're symptomatic, you should be calling student health. But the point is that we want to make sure that you're healthy and you avail yourself to the services that we have. Now, students who are required, they'll be choosing their appointment times and then their days will be assigned. We had to come up with an algorithm to make sure that we can fit everybody in. Next slide, please. So what are our key considerations for moving forward? Be aware of the fact, please, that at any time there can be new city or state mandates, right? In our case, the city of Philadelphia, and what it does is the major player that we listen to because they have jurisdictional authority when it comes to public health. And when we write to you about them, we have to listen to what they tell us. And they're very good. And, and for parents that are here with us today, too, they want both their city to be safe, the citizens to be safe, our students to be safe our workers as well. And we're all interested in that happening too. 
If there's an increase in city cases, if there's an increase in disease or death, and any of this happens to the point where the health commissioner has things to say, if, it ha if they say it to us at Drexel, they're going to say it to Temple and to Penn. But as you'll hear, the case-to-case -case transmission, transmission is not happening inside campus locations anywhere in the city. We have some track record on that. Our capacity for testing case investigation, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. If that gets exceeded, then we will have problems. And uh, do I expect that to happen? Of course I do not. We don't want to see that happen, but obviously we have an eye on that at all times. Do we have a set number? People have asked us. No, we don't, because it depends on how it plays out and what happens. We'd love to think that together we can do this uh, and do it well, and that everyone by now is used to what the public health messages are in order for us to move forward together. The rate of rise of infection among our campus community, many of you remember that Temple had to close early in the fall, and they really want to do it differently this time. It was less the number of people and more how fast it happened. So this business of staying away from gatherings and parties couldn't be more serious. Right? We really mean business when we tell you that. Certainly outbreaks elsewhere also can affect us. Next, I'm almost done. I want to mention here, because it's important to understand, that there is a compliance hotline. And that if you students know of a recent situation in which people in the community have been exposed or could be exposed due to a health and safety violation, we have a compliance hotline site uh, here and you see the address and it'll be up prominently on our website and then you know you click a button and you report it. So what do I mean by that? This is not a snitch culture and we don't want this to be a negative culture. There is nothing about this that any of us want to be punitive but we also are not a free-for-all where we're just putting stuff out and don't expect people to follow what we say. If students know, for example, and are upset about a large party or something that's happening, and they know that our students are involved, they have a way to let us know ahead of time before it happens. If there are events going on about people who think masks aren't being worn, we have a way so that we're aware of that and we're on it. I do wanna say with pride that barely anything has been coming in on this line, not because people haven't been telling us, we're well aware of our campus community, but in fact, because if anything, the neighbors even have been reporting over 90% compliance with what they've been seeing with mask wearing among our dragons. And for that, we have a lot of dragon pride. Next. So I am with this before I turn to Dr. Cruz, uh, who'll get a little bit more in the weeds about testing. And I know we are taking a lot of time for this, but these are important things. You've heard this from your friends that are at college campuses already. I know a lot of you are like, I get it, just let me get there already. And guess what? We're over here saying, we get it. Just bring them already. We miss you. We miss campus life. We miss one another. Just like you do, we do too. And we want to do it, but we want to do it right. We don't want to open and then have it all fall apart within a month, not because of anything that we weren't ready for, right? But because there is just a rollout of social gatherings and events. And no matter what we say and no matter what we do, it continues to happen. We have every indication that that's not the way that Drexel is going to go. I have to say that Temple sees that it will go well for them now, and Penn is already beginning to get to gear up as well for students moving back. And I want to also assure you that those of us who are leaders on the different campuses are meeting at least weekly all the time to compare what's going on, to share what works and what doesn't. We would love nothing more than student leaders on campus taking care of one another, understanding what a pod is being positive, letting us know when they need help, if there's too much social isolation and then they're not able to find others to safely be with and to be in touch with us and meet their testing schedule. So we can't wait to see you. Remember that you individually and collectively determine our outcome and we will be here all the time working with you to make this the reality that's coming our way as you move in uh, in the coming days. So dragons, wear masks and are responsible. And with that, I'm going to move to Dr. Cruz to talk to us more about what's happening in student health and testing. Janet. Thank you, Marla. So as a uh, member that really never went remote, I've been here every day at work, you know, since this all started and, and have followed the evolution of this virus. I am super excited to have the students back for sure. 
Um, so I know Marla went over, you know, what uh, this is going to look like, but I want to go through the nitty gritty of, you know, what this will look like for you and how we're accomplishing all of this. Next slide, please. So just to go over what we've been seeing on campuses, um, we have been doing our own contact tracing since March. We've, act we've actually done it uh, before with other infectious diseases as well. Um, again, to echo, we're seeing a lot of the transmission just out of the uh, out of campus, small gatherings, something as innocent as, you know, going together with five friends um, that aren't part of each other's bubble, right? Um, so that's the bulk of the transmissions that we're seeing on campus that echoes the healthcare providers um, in that realm as well. Um, we do have a, a specific or particular eye for our dorm housing. We've taken a lot of measures um, to make dorm housing safe. Um, and this is, you know, predominantly why they're, they're part of our, our regular screening. Um, so I want to go into the two phases of testing um, so far. So we have entry testing and that's what we're, we're doing currently. Um, we've done entry testing for the medical students so far in different populations. Um, and then next week will be the, the dorm housing. Um, the following week, so the week of the 25th, we'll start our surveillance or our regular screening cadence. Um, for college students, I, I mean, I'll echo what, what um, uh, Marla has said. Thankfully, a lot of our college students, um, they've done very well. Um, they've recovered with no, you know, no complications. We have um, regular interaction between the student health, um, the clinical arm, if you, if you will, and the contact tracing program. We monitor these students that, that do fall ill pretty quickly so that we can have medical interventions um, available to them quickly. Uh, thankfully, we haven't had to use um, a, a lot of the measures that um, the hospitals have had to use in our particular population, but we're ready in case that does happen. Next slide, please. So um, I, I like this um, pictorial because it, it just demonstrates all of the levels um, that we are putting in place to protect everyone. Um, I always joke with my students when they see me in clinic, I say, I have homework, you have homework, right? So our, our jobs is, is making sure that um, the environments that students are entering are safe, um, that we provide the, the clinical um, support that they need, um, but the personal responsibility, that's everyone's homework right now. Um, making sure we're doing the physical distancing, you know, the hand hygiene um, and all of those measures. And they tie in to how we keep our entire community safe. So I'll hone in on just the testing portion for today um, and how all of these pieces come together. Next slide, please. So for a lot of individuals that haven't interacted with the app just yet or getting ready to interact with, um, with the app as they come back to campus, um, for the testing, this is what it's gonna look for um, or look like. You're gonna go right into your app. You're gonna go into the scheduling or into your calendar. Um, and based on the type of student you, you are, you will have um, different appointments available to you. I do want to stress, um, just like um, you know, Marla ha has said, yes, we have mandated testing for certain groups, but we also have um, regular open testing for individuals that don't fall in these categories and do want to get tested. Next slide, please. So you will be asked to um, fill out our registration form. We collect information um, for several reasons. So one, we are a small extension uh, of the public health department. Um, we regularly share information so that um, they understand what's going on in universities um, and update our guidelines. Part of the information that we're also asking is some individuals may want to schedule a test and when they um, schedule the test, they might not have had symptoms, but then the day of they might have. And we're capturing um, that data so that we can reach out to them um, and see how they're doing, provide you know, clinical services when indicated. As well for individuals that may have gotten exposed, 
we like to get to these individuals early, right? Get them the, the right information. And this is how the, the app integrates with, you know, all the other branches um, of our surveillance operation. So you'll go into the app, you'll, you'll um, enter in your information, you'll be able to select um, a schedule that's available, and then you'll, you'll be able to confirm that appointment. Um, you'll also be able to, let's say something comes up and you need to reschedule for um, another time in that day, you will be able to go back into the app and check other appointments um, during that day. So we have that flexibility as well. Um, next slide, please. So after you get tested, and I'll go through exactly what that looks like, the results will go right into your um, health tracker app uh, or health checker app. The, the results typically take about 24 hours, and depending on um, a negative result or a positive result, each student, faculty member, or staff will get specific instructions on what to do next. Next slide, please. So I think this is the question that I get the most, especially from students, like how far up are you gonna go? Um, <laughs> the the uh, test is actually, we've modified the test. Um, it's, it's pretty um, non-invasive, um, well tolerated by, um, by everyone that we've tested so far. And what we do, we actually teach students to test on themselves. I think giving the student control, um, you know, is key. We also have healthcare trained personnel just in case, you know, these students are not hitting that sweet spot. We will, we will guide them through the test. So this is a PCR test. We do a mid turbinate collection that is just as accurate as going, you know, uh, that posterior nasal that we used to do when, when the test first came out. Um, the results come back in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, really, our, our, our turnaround times are within a day, um, especially if we, you know, the tests that we're doing through um, the testing site for surveillance as well as student health. Um, for asymptomatic students, so meaning uh, students that do not have any symptoms, um, that have been slated for mandatory testing once a week, they'll, they'll schedule their appointment, they'll report to the, their testing site, they'll get information there on how to, how to perform the test, um, and then that's it. The whole process is really about 30 seconds once you hit the, the, um, the testing site. The process is a little bit different for individuals that have been exposed or if they're symptomatic. So we really want these individuals to engage with our clinical team. Um, so individuals that are exposed or symptomatic, they will be prompted to call student health. They'll have an appointment with a clinician. Um, and there's various reasons for that. We wanna make sure that students that have immunocompromising conditions um, or anything that may make you know, being infected with COVID a little bit more complicated, um, that we address their needs pretty promptly. So I like to give people a reference in terms of when they should get tested. Um, I think availability at student health is, is so good that sometimes students will, will call the day that they have a sore throat. Um, we wanna make sure that we wait at least 24 hours since the onset of a symptom before we test them. Um, testing too early can lead to, you know, a false, um, a false negative. Um, for individuals that have been exposed, I get this question a lot, um, when should I get tested? So the best time to get tested after an exposure is about five to seven days after the actual exposure. And again, our clinical teams will guide you exactly when to get uh, tested, how to get tested, um, and how, how to sign up for testing. Next slide, please. So what do I do with a positive test or what happens after a positive test? So for individuals that are being tested through the, um, the testing site, um, within once the, the tests are, are processed, our case investigation team actually get all the positives right away. Um, the students are notified through the app, but then they will also get a phone call from our lead um, investigators with instructions um, in terms of what to do next. Um, in terms of medical assessment, um, our contact tracing team and our student health clinical team regularly interact. Um, 
we will assess what the isolation situation is, meaning individuals that have a positive test, we want to make sure that they can recover from their illness safely without exposing others. They, to do that, they'll need their own bathroom and their own bedroom. So individuals that do not have those, you know, don't have a bathroom to themselves, don't have a bedroom to themselves, we have provided um, rooms within the university so that they can isolate safely. And I, I think Sabir can talk a little bit to that, you know, to that effect, um, if you want to just comment on that now. Sure thing. Is the, can folks hear me? Okay. Um, so thanks, Janet. Yeah, so, um, and, and Katie is Amy Linsky, our Associate Vice President and Dean of Student Life is here too. And I suspect we'll get some questions when we get to the Q&A. We do have two residence halls on campus that are completely empty. They're for quarantine and isolation spaces. And I think it's important for this group to know that again, what guides us for pretty much every part of our reactivation of campus is health and safety. So from that perspective, we work hand in glove with Dr. Cruz and her team, and they're going to work with everyone who comes in for testing, and then they're going to contact us. And so if for whatever reason a student needs to be quarantined or in isolation and cannot do so in their own space or live on campus, that is the that is the primary reason that we have those spaces off campus. And that's part of the reason that we move towards limiting the number of students who are back in our residence halls. It's for that purpose. Um, so it's important for folks to know that we're going to give everyone a space that needs it in that category. Thank you, Sabir. So in terms of a positive result, um, once the students get a call from our contact tracer, again, we have our homework, you have your homework, right? So it's going to be um, crucial for individuals to uh, to let us know who they may have come in contact with during their infectious period. Um, our contact tracers will walk this, each of the students through that. Um, from there, we actually notify the contacts anonymously and we'll say you may have come in contact or you did come in contact with an individual during their infectious period. This is what you we need you to do next. So we'll walk our students through that. Um, for our individuals that haven't had any symptoms, that didn't have a positive test and have gotten exposed, they will be asked to quarantine. Isolation and quarantine are very similar, meaning we want individuals to stay in their rooms, we want individuals to use their own bathrooms and really limit their activities um, to those areas during the time of that we're observing them. Um, so during quarantine, individuals that have been exposed, we're observing to make sure that they don't develop um, symptoms of the disease. At about day five or day seven, we're gonna ask them to retest. Um, so these are individuals that haven't ever tested positive that have been exposed, right? So a little distinction, there's a little bit of overlap. Our case investigators and our contact tracers will walk all the students through this. Um, during that time, um, if there are individuals that live in the dorm, we will help support um, regarding food, regarding laundry. Um, the most, at least from my end, from a clinical end, um, we check on these students every day. Um, so we'll do surveys, we'll do intermittent phone calls to make sure that individuals that, that um, are manifesting symptoms of the disease, that they're doing well. Um, or if they're asymptomatic, we check on them daily to make sure that we catch early when, um, if, if they're going to develop symptoms. Um, with that said, it's going to be very important for everyone to participate in this process. Um, so later in the in the Q and A, we could talk a little bit more about um, you know the the role of uh, student conduct with this for individuals that. Um, you know, have have um, trouble just following, you know, our guidances. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to put it together on how all of these systems really interplay um, from the testing, both the the surveillance testing that we're doing through the um, the the uh, different sites, uh, Race Hall, um, soon to be Queen Lane and New College Building, um, as well as the diagnostic testing done uh, through Student Health, 
that in, especially for individuals that are positive or have been exposed, those get handed to our contact tracing team pretty quickly. We um, we survey the, the situation within 24 hours. Um, we make sure that individuals can isolate and quarantine safely. If um, an individual was on campus, we make sure that we engage with the university to make sure those spaces are cleaned in an appropriate manner. Um, and again, all of it falls into this active monitoring. So for individuals that that um, that never test positive, we still want you to engage with this app. Uh, make sure you're daily you're going in daily to the app, reporting any symptoms, or if you don't have any symptoms at all, report that too. Um, and these systems all work together um, to make sure that everyone stays safe. Next slide, please. So with that, I, I'll leave it. Um, Again, we are all leaders. We're all doing this together. Um, your college experience will be different. However, um, I've seen pretty amazing things from our, our young population. You guys are innovative. Um, just the way that people have shifted on how to interact with un, uh, one another. Um, I teach medical students. I teach residents. I'm always um, surprised with the new ways um, individuals um, come up with, especially within COVID now, on how to interact with each other. Um, we are all boots on the ground, um, meaning um, everyone's going to be doing their part, um, surveilling, making sure that these systems are working. We want your feedback. So if there are systems that um, can work better, please let us know. Um, you, you all are going to be the key to communication with one another, connection, um, and we're all going to be working together um, in terms of interacting in this new world, world within COVID. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, I'm going to hand it back to um, Marla just for some other remarks or, or just elaboration on what we talked about so far. Muting is not my usual. You can see that we have our website up there. I think we're gonna we're gonna open for Q and A next. Is that right, folks? So uh, the one thing I want to say, I eyeball the questions. The one thing I didn't comment on, but let me comment on right here so that there uh, we can minimize all the questions that come in, and that is about vaccine because I see repetitive questions. So just to say quickly that at this time, the university, as many of you read uh, yesterday, we have not directly received a vaccine. We have no indication that we will be. The phase response nationally is also going on locally. In Philadelphia, it is overseen again by the health department and we are still in phase 1A, although 1B is starting very soon. So 1A are mainly healthcare providers uh, and that includes our College of Medicine uh, and College of Nursing and Health Professions clinical students, as well as some researchers working with COVID and some others doing clinical facing things. We're in touch with the health department to see if we can at least hold a vaccination clinic for those students. And we're in those negotiations right now. Uh, students are able to get vaccine in some other areas. There is no plan to make the vaccine mandatory for students at this time and uh, we don't have further comments to make about that. So we're not expecting anybody to arrive vaccinated. We have no nothing mandated about that and we can't, we wish we could, but none of us in Philadelphia can give you a plan that the university has the ability to vaccinate its own. If the city or the state were to give us the vaccine that we've been requesting, we could overnight set up a way to vaccinate our campus community, but that's not how vaccine is rolling out currently in the city. So with that, let me make sure that we leave time here. We have Q&A, a number of other things. Elizabeth uh, or Sandra, who's gonna be handling the questions, please? Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra. I will be um, helping moderate the some of the question and answer. Uh, so first, thank you to everyone who uh, was able to submit questions in advance. Um, we did, uh, we will go through some of those by topic area. Uh, we're also working to answer uh, the live event Q&A um, that are coming in, and some of these are uh, sure to be answered uh, when we go through our pre-submitted questions. Um, so if you have additional questions, please continue to 
submit them via the Q&A function. While we may not get to everyone, um, we will have the copy of the Q&A transcript and we'll be able to respond following the event. Um, as a reminder, all of the uh, FAQs that come in are going to be updated and posted on Drexel's coronavirus website. So be sure to continue to check the website for the most up-to-date information. That is where everything will be updated as well as um, for additional contact information for who you can reach out to for additional questions. So I just want to remind everyone of the website. And again, that's drexel.edu slash coronavirus. All right, with that being said, I'm going to um, kick it over to Elizabeth Van Boxdale, who's going to uh, assist us with some of the uh, pre-submitted questions, and we'll chime in with any additional Q&A for as long as we have time. Thank you, Sandra, and good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll start with academics, and I would like to direct the first couple of questions to Provost Jensen. Provost Jensen, will pass, no pass, grading continue throughout the remainder of the academic year? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, we have been using pass, no pass all year uh, for our winter quarter. We're in uh, pass, no pass, and our, our semesters are um, operating with a mix of, of both, actually. Uh, I am meeting with the deans and uh, the faculty next week to have a discussion about spring quarter, so I, I anticipate we'll have an announcement about grading for the spring quarter next week. Great. The second question is, will students, especially international, be given a choice to do the spring quarter online? Yeah, so we, we recognize the importance of the flexibility of offering programs online. I think there's likely to be some variability by program, particularly at the graduate level. So I think the best thing to do is to check with your program managers about that for spring. Thank you so much, Provost Jensen. Now we'll switch to the category of health and safety, and I'll direct these questions to either Marla Gold or Janet Cruz. The first question is, by gathering people in a common location to receive tests, everyone standing in line is at risk. What steps will be taken to ensure testing sites will be as safe as possible? So I could start with this question. Um, we've already engaged with environmental to go in and actually evaluate the facility. Um, we have all, you know, the appropriate, making sure that the, um, the air quality is fine. We actually haven't had um, lines. Um, again, our, our schedules are made um, to help limit the amount of volume that we're receiving. So that's already inherently built into the schedule, especially with our race hall um, testing site. Uh, a lot of the, the waiting area is actually outdoors. Um, so we make sure that people are physically spaced, everyone's masked and it's outdoors. Um, but our, our testing site um, has been tried and true and tested um, and we're able to process people really quickly through. So there's not a lot of waiting time um, that we've experienced so far. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. The next question maybe um, is for Marla. Um, if COVID cases begin increasing regardless of policies, what are Drexel's plans to respond? Will classes move back online and undergraduates be asked to move out of housing again? I understand Drexel's desire to reinstate in-person classes, but fear the consequences of housing thousands of students in close quarters with only a promise that they won't engage in risky behavior. Marla? Yeah, so it's a, it's a multifaceted question. Let me say, first of all, that uh, we have approximately, last I knew, about 1,100 students coming into university housing. The thousands of students, and there are several thousand, live in off-campus housing, many of them still in mandatory testing programs. And many of them who live there have been living there all along, so we have e experience with the populations. We, as I mentioned during the presentation, there is no set number uh, of cases per se. What will matter is where it happens and how fast it happens and if it happens at all. So we're certainly uh, not naive. We have had, uh, we call them tabletop or we have had drills internally where we've looked at the system and said, okay, what will happen if within a week this occurs or within two weeks this occurs or what will happen if the city 
says, you guys are doing great, but we need everyone to please just stay in the dorms for a couple of days while we take care of other things that are happening. And most important is that we believe that we have the ability to roll with that. You know, could it happen that there are suddenly a buildup of cases in one dorm? I have to say that it's highly unlikely. I don't want to eat those words. It has to do with, of course, our collective behavior. And in terms of asking, isn't it a lot to bank on the belief that the students who are coming are going to be able to do what we're asking them to do? My answer is I'm banking on that belief. I'm going to come right back around again, staring right at my camera and say, that's right, families, parents, students, we are banking on the belief that you understand this situation or else you wouldn't be choosing to come back and join us, nor would we feel okay about inviting you back. So the goal is in fact to have containment, to take care of people uh, and to do the best we can to get through this together while hopefully vaccine increases all around us and we can get that to people at Drexel. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'll ask one more question, then I'll turn it over to Sandra for some of the live Q&A questions. And this one would be directed to Dr. Cruz. With respect to individuals who previously have had COVID, the question is, people who have been previously infected are told to avoid tests for three months to avoid a false positive. How will the university be able to distinguish between false positives and true positives? Dr. Cruz? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So um, for individuals that have tested positive, especially as, as individuals are coming onto campus, one, we ask that if you are tested outside of our system, meaning not in student health and not through our, our testing site, that you actually use the app and upload a copy of your test. So that's one. The reason we ask for that is, um, yes, for individuals that have tested positive, we actually exempt them from our screening program um during that time however if individuals uh test or excuse me if they start to develop symptoms they are going to be evaluated by a clinician and at that time it may be appropriate to retest them for um for covid again so again um we take those on a case-by-case -case basis however individuals that have tested positive you will have a three-month um, exemption to our screening or our, our surveillance um, testing. Great, thank you Dr. Cruz. Actually before I turn to Sandra let me ask some from our section on student experience and I will direct these to uh, Subir. Um, with respect to housing, what is the protocol Drexel will follow if a student in a dormitory tests positive? Subir? Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm actually going to turn it over to Katie Zamulinski, who's our Associate Vice President and Dean of Student Life, as uh, it's really her and her team who are leading those efforts. Katie? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, that's a great question. And the process that we have in place to support students that need to isolate or quarantine uh, is pretty straightforward. So we'll get information from student health if one of our residents has tested positive. And at that point, a member of the student life team will reach out to the student uh, via phone and we'll have a conversation. We'll talk them through um, what quarantine or isolation looks like uh, and then we'll coordinate a check-in time uh, to move them into one of the halls that we have reserved for those purposes. So the first thing a student can expect is a friendly voice on the other side of the phone having a conversation and talking them through next steps. Great, thank you Katie. Um, we have a question. All my classes are online. Can I still enter the campus and use facilities like the library, collaboration rooms, et cetera? So Elizabeth, I'm happy to uh, take that. Um, so our campus is open um, and, and you know, we, we fully expect and as, as Dr. Gold said, you know, we have several thousand students who are living all around the campus community. Um, and, and they could be in face to face classes or remote. And so, you know, our campus spaces will remain open. They'll be open on a modified basis. Hours might change. 
Uh, we might have social distancing measures in place. I, I saw there was a question about the rec center. The rec center is scheduled to be open on the 25th with limited volume within the space and it's open to any student as it always is. Again, and you know, I really appreciate what Marla said earlier. We're banking on our students doing the right thing and making the right decisions. Um, whether they are in face to face or remote classes and we believe we believe in our student body that they know what's going on and they're going to do the right thing. So the quick answer to that question is yes, our spaces are open to any students as is normal, um, but there'll be probably some modifications in place for all of those spaces. Thank you so much for that. Um, since we're really running out of time, I will turn it over to Sandra for some questions from the live Q&A. Hello everyone, so we're working to answer many of your questions in the Q&A, um, although we will probably run out of time before we get to everyone. I want to remind everyone um, that we will address these questions on the coronavirus website and in FAQs, so we will be following up about these questions. Um, while we're on the topic of student life, there are several questions about other uh, things on campus that will be open. Uh, things like dining halls, um, other eateries and facilities. Um, uh, Subir, do you and your team want to comment on other uh, facilities that will be open for students? Uh, sure, Sandra, it sounds like that question is really geared towards dining spaces on campus, so I'm going to turn it to Don Liberati, who oversees Rexel Business Services. Don? Don, are you on? So it, it seems like Don's having some uh, technical difficulties. Um, we have all of our, we will have dining facilities available on campus as well as some outdoor facilities. All of that is listed online. And so Sandra, probably the best bet is that we will incorporate that into the FAQs, which, which most is already there um, post this session. All right, absolutely, thank you. There are also several question, questions about the Health Checker app. So maybe we can turn it back to Dr. Gold and Dr. Cruz. Um, so several students have questions about signing up on the app. Um, who needs to schedule a test? When do they need to schedule a test? Could you just quickly review um, what students should be doing and when as far as scheduling um, their test for coming to campus? So I could start with that. Um, so individuals that are moving in, especially in dorm um, housing um, in the next week, the schedules are open. So we've opened schedules for certain populations as you know they're entering. Um, so the goal is that you get tested the day that you move in. So I, you know, I, I saw some questions kind of in the chat. So yes, um, please schedule your tests the day that you're supposed to move in. I think it just makes it a lot easier for everyone, right? Um, the in, in terms of um, other populations, so uh, um, a lot of the other populations like um, College of Nursing, um, College of uh, Medicine, they're um, they have already been notified in terms of you know going into the app and and scheduling an appointment um, for ACC um, and API properties. Um, they will be asked to go into the app the week of the 18th to get, you know, um, scheduling to get their um, um, their first entry um, uh, appointment done. Um, and then it, again, to reiterate, it's the week of the 25th where um, you'll get into that cadence of your day of testing. Once um, the week of for the week of the 25th, students will receive a notification 48 hours before they're scheduled to test saying, hey, you're you're due for testing in, in 48 hours. Please log into the app and schedule a test. And that's going to start um, in the next um, in, in the next two weeks. Marla, I don't know if you wanted to clarify. Go ahead. No. I think that that's a great job. I don't have a clarification. Um, you know, as I asked, as I mentioned to everybody, it's very, very complex. Uh, and please, please, there'll be issues that you hit with the app and there'll be ways for you to find that information out. We'll be helping troubleshoot it as you get here. Yes, I'm also hearing um, if there are issues with the app or issues with your student status or move in, um, just be sure to contact housing. Um, and the folks that you're in touch with about move in in order to schedule your test. 
I know we have to wrap up. I'm going to ask if I can make a quick comment before we do. Is that okay, Sandra? Okay. Thanks, everybody. So first, again, thanks for making the time. Um, every time we do these, you know, we're busy writing to each other saying we need another half hour. We know that there's always more questions. We may have generated more questions by some of the answers that we're giving. It is very complex. We're in a dynamic pandemic, um, but we are able to do these moves again with percentages and rates and information that are exceedingly lower than any urban center and certainly than the state that we're in and, and all other states for that matter. But I do ask one thing, which is that those of you students who are on, perhaps you're with other students or you have roommates or other people you know, parents or parents and students that are on together, this is the time as you come off of this to have conversations in home, wherever that home is, it's off campus and you're here already, you know, you're still living with parents or friends, but not quite close to the campus yet. And think about it because everything we're describing and all of these systems that work, you might say it's because there's a pandemic and of course we agree, but these systems are designed because not just of the pandemic, but the behaviors that people continue to have during the pandemic. So it's not a lecture at you, but just to ask you to join with us in thinking about your choices, what you can do, and how that becomes all of these things. Everything you hear about and are asking about for the most part that has to do with health and safety is designed in mind for people, the vast majority, almost all who come to us and have COVID who have exposures in these small gatherings and events completely off campus, but then involve the campus community when they happen. We want you to be well, we want to be well with you, and we look forward to coming together very, very soon. So thanks so much for joining us today. Please get back to that website, take a look at information, please read the emails that we send you, and we'll continue to say, send more information, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.